Hi guys, and welcome to VR Essentials, where we talk about the practical uses of virtual reality. Today, very exciting, in our episode five, season one of the Meta Business Podcast, we can learn all the ins and outs and behind the scenes of the metaverse. We're talking to the founder of Deficit Games, who have released a really awesome title that's been pretty much spoken about by a lot of the biggest influencers on YouTube called VR Skater. Now there are some timestamps below, of course, so you can skip to wherever you want to go. And don't miss, of course, last week's episodes or the few weeks before that as well, as we spoke to the team behind Synth Riders of Cluj Interactive, as well as the lead developer and founder of Walkabout Mini Golf and many more. So do make sure you enable the bell after you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes, of course. So without further ado, Let's roll the tape. Andy, really a pleasure to have you today on the call. Maybe it would be really awesome is uh, first just uh, give a pre-introduction pre as to who you are and uh, what you do. Yeah, I'm Andy from Deficit Games, the founder and CEO, creative director, developer, lead designer. <laughs> and we're a very small team. And we founded, I founded the company in 2017. And we started with developing mobile VR games for Oculus Go and Google Daydream. And now we're developing VR Skater. Um, I claim that's the world's first authentic consumer VR skateboarding game. And it's available as an alpha on Steam Early Access. So maybe what we can talk about is um, how, well, where, where did, so you have, you created your own uh, company called Deficit Games, right? So. Uh, are you are you one of the actual programmers as well? And if so, um, how did you learn about programming and getting into game development? Um, I started game development, professional game development, uh, in 2016. I don't have a gaming industry background. I worked in film industries, design, 3D animation, and also I was a screenwriter for a daily soap in the past. Um, but so there was a break in my life and I changed many things and VR was something I was always interested in and, and uh, fascinating. And then those modern VR headsets came out and they were affordable. And I put all my money into a gaming PC and the HTC Vive before I was a Mac only guy. Okay. In the past I used MS DOS and windows 3.1 windows 95, but then I put all my money into this gaming PC and I started developing because um, creating creating things, creating stuff is um, something I want to do. So I always wanted to do, I will make music also. And then I started developing and learning and learning. And the first, first I tried to find um, programmers, old friends and colleagues from my studies, but they weren't interested. So I decided, okay, I do it myself. And then I started to learn and develop a VR mini golf game for Google Daydream. And then, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And Which is on the uh, website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Daydream was, uh, it was a failure to target this platform because Google just is just not able to, to market and to make a new platform big. And uh, I, I don't want to rant about Google, but yeah, it was a fail. And then we you, you had to, some challenges, sure. Yeah, yeah, and the platform died. Nobody talks about Daydream anymore. And then the Oculus Go came up, and I had a new partner, a 3D designer, and then we've developed another game and ported the game. And oh, it doesn't sell too well, but Oculus Go is not a big platform. But we survived. Oh, so that's how the, did you get into, so when you were, that's very interesting, you were in animation before and you were doing script writing and stuff. Um, yeah. So your first experience in developing a game or programming was when you were doing a VR game, nothing nothing before that? Uh, um, nothing professional. So I, so I started programming when I was a preteen. Right, okay. It was fascinating okay. and basic, Q basic coding, Turbo Pascal. Right. But only hobbyish hobby and then in my studies at the university um, I had JavaScript and 
little programs, small programs, but right. nothing prof professional. I have mm -hmm. always been fascinated um, to see the whole thing. And I've done a lot of creative, different creative stuff in my life and right. gaming and VR. I can put it all together mm -hmm. in one product. And that's so the most how, how, fun thing I've ever did is developing VR. <laughs> right. How, how did you get into animation first? Um, it was when I studied, when I was a student. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. I learned it as an, a course specialization. Right. And well, what I find interesting is that the, um, okay, we'll talk about VR Skater in a while, which is using apparently the Unreal Engine. Yeah. Uh, but you were using the Unity engine before? No. You never decided, used Unity? Never used Unity before. Okay. I decided for Unreal because, so it was a decision. Mm -hmm. What Which tool I'm going to use. Right. And I think Unreal has a more designer-friendly approach. Right. From, from what I know. Mm -hmm. And I saw great potential in the engine and what Epic Games does and how they support developers and they're growing and growing thanks to Fortnite. <laughs> right. And yeah. And I love Unreal Engine. So, Did you manage, yeah. how did you actually, so you learned the engine at university or on your own later on? On my own. Yeah. Right. And, and what kind of resources were you able to find? Because I've spoken to so many other devs who told me that the reason why they didn't learn Unreal wasn't because they're not interested in it. It's because there's a lack of assets and also resources to learn it if they have any problems along the way. So how did you manage to counter those challenges and find the solutions? You know, I found enough resources. Okay. Um, and at the time I started, okay, there weren't not many resources. Now it's great. Right. Uh, yeah, I figured it out, trial and error and um, asking in, in forums or... But so what I love is prototyping, fast prototyping, quick, rapid prototyping. Mm -hmm. And um, for the hard programming stuff, I have a programmer now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But at the beginning, when you first started, you were, I mean, even with VR Skater, were, were you working with a programmer as well? Or were you on your own at the beginning? Uh, on my own. I had a 3D designer and... And, um, you know, I can tell you the story of VR Skager. <laughs> yeah, of so course. Kind of, so, because um, we've... So how did VR Skager come about? <laughs> yeah. Um, the first thing is um, I always wanted to do something personal. I wanted to add something personal to a game. Mm -hmm. And but to make a game with a story that's... Um, we're too small for that. And uh, we can't make game. A plus game as a small team, mm -hmm. and I'm I was a musician and um, I played in some punk rock bands and all the skating, cosmos the scene. So I'm very related to that. And we had two more games in the making at that time for Oculus Go, and then I said, "Come, let's let's make a your skateboarding game." And my colleague said, oh, "No, that's not possible. That doesn't make any sense." <laughs> can't feel good and <laughs> i was motivated by that and into the night that night i developed a quick prototype where you could skate on a on a block just mm -hmm. a block in a, a neutral environment and the pushing i I've developed this pushing mechanics it was a google daydream prototype and a simple ollie and then my colleague tested it and some other friends and everybody had fun just with surfing on that block Mm -hmm. said okay and then we decided to cancel all the other projects because they were okay but i realized that they can't succeed on the market and when you when you developed uh vr skater were you surprised that there wasn't something already like that uh anywhere in vr ah uh, both surprised and not surprised because it's it's a bad idea to make a you know, skateboarding game. <laughs> Why? You, I mean, clearly yeah. it's not. So <laughs> when when people will see a video um, about the game, players and said, ah, "Why you don't do this? Why you don't have a full body?" Um, uh, or you have to look constantly down. You don't have to look constantly down in our game, and. 
why you don't have feet and why you do this and that. And yeah, they're right. It's it sounds weird to to make a skateboard game where you skate with your hands. So on the first thought, it sounds weird, and you have a lot of motion in it and jumping and falling and people who don't know much about vr said oh i i will get sick i will get motion sick but that's not true <laughs> um yeah it's a challenging thing to recreate that feeling and to make it feel good fun and comfortable but the problem is that everybody has a certain idea of a skateboard game because some um, it has to say it has to be like Tony Hawk's. We need to make big airs in 900s. Then there are the Skater XL and Session fans, hardcore skateboard simulations, and there are also more arcadey stuff out there. And it, everybody has a certain opinion, and that makes it really hard. Uh, but I think right. we we come we came up with something what's really unique and different to all those skateboarding games out there in on the 2D market. So when you were developing uh, VR Skater, what was the most important thing for you uh, to begin with that you try to focus on the most? Oh, it changed. It changed after time and it changed and it changed. The most important thing was that we want to create something. We are know about what we're doing. We know how skateboarding works. We know what tricks, how it feels. We know about the culture. And the most important thing in the first place was to recreate that feeling um, of the late 90s. And um, it was originally, it was planned as an Oculus Go game, very arcadey, very straightforward. Um, but yeah. So we, you've been we, working on it for, for quite some time then? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are, right. um, we are, yeah, I will tell you later then because we've, already developed a arcade version for a fashion brand on the Oculus Quest. But this was an on-location experience only, very arcadey. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing in VR Skater was to make a game that's fun and has a certain depth and complexity because that is skateboarding. It's the balance between um, success and failure because skateboarding means progress through failure and try it over and over again. And then you land right. a trick and trick and it feels great so yeah i did it and that is also a problem because there are not many vr games out there that has a certain depth and complexity and the learning mm -hmm. curve right where you get better and better and the new controls and i have the feeling people are not already right uh already <laughs> ready for some right. kind of game how, how did you manage to, to get all those tricks? Did you research all of them? Did you work with a skater? Uh, how did you manage to put all the tricks together? Um, we decided to not to offer all the tricks you have in, in hardcore simulations like Session. Mm -hmm. um, but we, the whole team, have been into skateboarding in their past. And we know about the standard tricks that are important, the right. street skateboarding tricks. It's a street skateboarding mm -hmm. game. It's not a vert, vert game like mm -hmm. Tony Hawk's, so no pools or half pipes. Um, the standard street skateboarding tricks mm -hmm. we want to, to cover in our game. There are already some players who want this trick and this trick and a lot of more modern skateboarding tricks, but we're limited. We're a small team and we have our mm -hmm. concept. And, um, yeah, we need to carefully decide what we're implementing in the game and what not. So when you were doing the testing, did you work with skaters to, to stay? I, I mean, you guys, okay, you guys have a background in, in skating. So yeah. uh, I guess that helps a lot, of course. But did you also pass it to other uh, not skateboarders? Really. Not really, because um, you always need mm -hmm. skateboarders that are also playing VR games. Mm -hmm. And then some people, when they're first time in VR, they totally overwhelmed mm -hmm. and uh, a game with artificial movement is not good for beginners so how challenging was it to uh to program the uh because you're using the touch controllers mainly right yeah uh, so how, how challenging was it to program those controllers to actually do all the movements to do the tricks because there, there's a lot of tricks in, in in this game it's pretty pretty deep 
Yeah, the most challenging thing was to balance the controls and to find the balance. What is a movement and a gesture and what's mapped to buttons? Because it's totally different in a VR environment mm -hmm. and it's not a gamepad. And fingers and arms are have different mappings in the brain. So that was the most challenging thing to, to find the balance of what's important. There are some players that do crazy stuff mm -hmm. we, we can't do, <laughs> but there are also players that have huge problems with understanding the motions. But what's a very interesting, interesting thing is when skaters, players with a skateboarding background, so mm -hmm. players that cannot kickflip in real life, they instantly get the hang of it. Instantly. Right. Yeah. They have the coordination. Yeah, and they, they say, yeah, this motion makes sense. It feels like a kickflip. Yeah. All right. So the actual gestures that you created yeah. uh, actually uh, flow with the actual real, yeah. uh, real world like, kind of situation, right? In, in the real world, you're kicking your front foot mm -hmm. to your back front side, mm -hmm. um, and the controller is the same. In right. the first place, it sounds um, when you, it sounds weird for some people. Oh, it will, it feels like handboarding. No, it doesn't, and that's the important fact in the game that you never have the feeling to move the board with your hands. That's an important thing we wanted to avoid. Um, we had uh, mechanics implemented, implement mechanics um, mm -hmm. that you can turn the board with your hands, but it felt just wrong yeah and right. it's important that you have a certain ex abstractions and when you skateboard in real life you use your upper body your upper yes. body gets yes. sour after a long skate session right and that's why those motions feel natural to skaters they feel natural yeah. for cool. non-skaters it's hard to understand why i have to flick my controller to the front right mm -hmm. i can't remember the yeah. also i'd like to talk a little bit more about the physics uh, because obviously every trick has a different set of physics. It couldn't have been easy to to play around with that. You must have done a lot of experimentation. How how do you manage to, you know, what kind of tips or, or tricks you use that you can share um, to get the physics right in something like this? Okay, difficult questions. Uh, question. Um, your skater is not a fully physics-based game like those modern skateboard simulations, it's kind of semi-physical. And that's why it, we have some limitations. And, but it was necessary because the game would have become too hard if it would be in physics simulation because the, the rails are just kind of magnetic. And you, when you're doing a grind, it pushes you in the right direction a bit. Mm -hmm. It's still hard, okay, it's still hard, but if it was a more tolerant, it would look very weird when you <laughs> flying to the rail. And, you know, tips, I don't know, it's just VR, the thing in VR is you have to test, to test, to test, to test, and you have to test it in VR, and you, you can't feel it on the flat screen and simulate it on a flat screen. Right. It was just trial and error, and... And try it again and how feels the kickflip um how high has an ollie uh, needs to be the ollie that it feels right the ollie is ridiculously high in our game right but and all oh, the obstacles are huge um the, uh, the picnic tables are double the size um they have in real life but it feels just different in vr and you know that was we're challenging to get the sweet spot in mm -hmm. um, speed, height, right, and, and physics, and how affect the physics the actual camera, because when the camera turns around, it's very uncomfortable. And so our focus was to create a comfortable experience. Right. You can, at at yeah. the moment, the camera is first person, right? Are you looking to develop a? Or are you working on a, a, a spectator view 
for for people is that something you you had planned yeah we in our first prototypes we had a third person camera but only with a hat and the controllers and the board and the thing is um that everything every idea or every um, feature you implement it mm -hmm. has it brings more um, right other things like people want to customize their avatar right or their shirt we can't can't implement legs because it's just not possible it's a lot of reasons for that but please believe me <laughs> it's better no, I, I understand and i think that's great to hear this because yeah. uh, i guess a lot of developers especially in experience ones think of the of the mood and want to do everything and then they end up doing nothing uh you guys you're telling me now what you're focusing on so please carry on yeah for example if you have a third person camera you want to have an customized avatar even if it's just the the hat or hair or mm -hmm. um, skin color and you need to um, also make sure that there's diversity in different skin colors and everything um, female male diverse and so on it's a lot of work mm -hmm. so you have to decide what can we implement in the game and pc market is very hard steam pc vr we we don't sell enough copies far from that and so we have to carefully decide mm -hmm. um, and if you have a full body um, character complete character you need to have cool animations and motion capturing for skateboard tricks it's very expensive it it's i think the complete budget from now we <laughs> what i need to need to invest into motion capturing right all the all animations because when they look um cringe weird it's just not cool so, mm -hmm. yeah i think one of the only uh known uh, i mean for example there's a company called rezo not sure if you heard of those guys they have a vr game which is the football game um, so mm -hmm. they actually use motion capture to put on the shoe, um, so that it would be marketed to clubs and, you know, these kind of people, uh, to actually learn how to, to become a footballer or to learn how to kick more accurately mm -hmm. or something like that. So if they can't go in a field, uh, they could do it, you know, from the comfort of their own home kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it, it raises another set of issues and technical problems, uh, and then the way you would create your game, I would imagine, uh, would be a different game, right? Because then you're using yeah. different parts of the the body. You just wanted to have something first that that provides a sensation of being on a skateboard, see how it goes, and then later tweak whatever you need to tweak to to make it a bit different. Would that be correct? Um, yeah. Okay. Did you did you so you guys used uh, C plus plus or what kind of language do you use with um, with Unreal? So Unreal is C plus plus based the engine, and, but ninety percent of our game is Blueprint coded. That's the visual scripting in Unreal. Um, so I thought we can make a Blueprint only game, but mm -hmm. there are some C plus plus classes already there especially for online leaderboard stuff. Right. Yeah. And did you use any, um, are there any uh, plugins that you can recommend to use when people are trying to develop a game? Or do you um, write your own? I, I think um, that Unreal Engine gives you a tool set that's nearly perfect. Right. But what's the most important thing is um, do projects that you can do in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I don't want wanted to make this mistake to do a two project that's too big, but mm -hmm. now we are scared as too big. <laughs> so we right. have three three guys and there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, we have we have a soundtrack, a licensed soundtrack. We have to mm -hmm. do one by ourselves and we have no marketing budget and we have to do the marketing all by ourselves. And, you know, I think things more <laughs> mm -hmm. when you start, that's the most important tip and use Unreal Engine. I love it. And use Blender. Right. Yeah. So um, what, what what's changed since the release of the game uh, for you mainly? 
have you had uh, I don't know interest in backing or uh, more resources that called you and said hey I'd like to help you on the game well, what's changed since you've released it um, first thing is we had no idea how the players um, like the game uh, find the mm -hmm. game and we had no, we had no idea um, if it can succeed because when you work in more um, nearly two years on a project, you don't right. know anything. And, right. But it's crazy how um, um, what what the players say, and they really like the game. We have a lot of positive reviews, hundred percent positives in the last thirty days. And once you get a hang of it, the game, and you understand what we're trying to tell with the game and why it is, right. how it is. Mm -hmm. But people love it. But what I also realized is that um, to release on PC VR first was not the best idea. Um, it's, yeah, we will finish the game on PC VR, but we have um, a hard time to um, have enough funds. Okay. So I uh, let me... Early access Sorry, go would, on. So I thought we thought that early access would solve the problem and mm -hmm. help us to finish the game, but well, it's harder than expected. Much harder. I mean, obviously, there's always challenges with being uh, an indie developer and you know these kind of things, right? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you have a product which, uh, believe me, you're already, you know, compared to a lot of people. Uh, way up there with that experience, but it, it, let, let us know a little bit more about um, why did you decide to release on Steam VR uh, or or do a PC title first? Uh, what what was your thinking? What was your strategy? Um, you know, and uh, yeah, just be great to hear that. Okay, um, we decided to target PC VR because you have a lot of creative freedom mm -hmm. on the one side. Yeah, um, I will um, tell you about the downsides later. You have creative freedom and you're able to release a game in an alpha state and that's great. And we thought, okay, we have a game, it's ready to, to give it to the people. And our trailer was very successful um, before we released the game and some publishers reached out and everybody wants to have a skateboarding game in VR. Mm -hmm. And the launch was cool, but not good enough. And yeah, PC, VR, and Steam gives you a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to, to sell enough copies there. So everybody knows that. And the downside of PC, VR is clearly that there are so many different types of hardware you have to support. And if you don't support it, so people criticize you, oh, and there are so many different PC setups, mm -hmm. and you can't avoid that there's a setup the game is not working on, and then you right. get a bad review. And that takes a lot of time and work to make a PC game. And the the people um, expect the quality they expect. It's very high mm -hmm. on PC. Right. Where you have a gaming machine, you have a very expensive headset. You want to see quality graphics and um, dance textures and, and yeah, great games. And, but there are not, not so many players on PC VR and, and they are not as not willing to pay the prices we need to charge. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of vicious circle. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an imbalance between what you can earn as a developer and mm -hmm. the revenue you can generate and what people expect. So, and now I see the problem. And I totally understand that every publisher said, oh, we, we will go on Quest 2 and PC VR, uh, PS VR, sorry. Right. <laughs> and yeah. And, and um, so we, we've opened XR coming, you know, next year, uh, hopefully not too far. Um, are you looking to port your game to, to that? So at least every single VR headset could actually be able to play it without having to redo code or adaptation for various different uh, hardware? Um, yeah, no, but 
that's not so easy for us because um, all the controllers, for example, mm -hmm. we have the index controllers and the Windows Mixed Reality controllers. Mm -hmm. The new, I think they're very bad. <laughs> And right. we have to change um, things in the game mechanics and how we analyze the motion and the speed. It's, they have different interpretations of speed. And yeah, the, the index controllers are very accurate and the G2 controllers, um, HP Reverb G2 controllers aren't. So we have to, to yeah, make changes for every headset uh, or control type of controllers. Right. So the uh, controllers is the main the main issue, really. Yeah. Okay. That's an issue. And um, marketing is hard on PC VR market. That's the main problem. <laughs> because when you work with Oculus or uh, Sony, um, they put you in the storefront. The way I understand it is that uh, doing a game on PC VR is, 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 is tougher because a lot of the people who use PC VR are used to hardcore AAA games. Uh, they expect really good graphics and also um, there's a lot of different hardware, different drivers you have to deal with. So that could also be a, a challenge of its own. Um, but in terms of the, uh, so marketing distribution, you find, have you tried to approach, um, you know, publishers who, who are non PCVR as well, or, how did you go about the marketing? So of course, it's challenging, but what are the steps that you've taken uh, to try and get as many people to know about your, your game as possible? Okay. Um, the thing is that we have a lot of media, we had a lot of media coverage and right. um, in every, in the whole we are press and YouTubers uh, played the game and also non vr focused youtubers played the game mm -hmm. for example sam Taba, the video still gets more than a thousand views every day it has over 450k views you know, right them. and so but it's hard to get enough visibility on steam and yeah because if you sell a lot of copies you you are visible in Steam if you <laughs> don't so uh, you're not visible. So right. we in Germany say the cat bites his own tail. <laughs> and um, uh, concerning publishers, yes, yeah, some reached out to us um, very early before the game was released already. Right. Yeah. And there were comes with conversations and also with Oculus and there's a lot of interest for the games, for the game, VR Skater, and that's very cool. It isn't a bad game and is, it's unique and there is no competition at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that could, that, that could develop from this. It's, a, it's an amazing concept, I think, what you guys have done. So what, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to, to uh, develop the Quest version now? Well, what's next for... Uh, for VR Skater, or are you, because uh, as indie developers, a lot of you guys, I understand also, you know, have other projects that you're working on. So, you know, what, what's next for, for, for you per se? Is it VR Skater Quest or something completely different? Oh, the prior priority is to finish the PC game. Okay. Uh, we won't um, abandon the game. Um, we will finish it, but mm -hmm. it's hard because we need more funds at the moment. And after the final PC release, we will start to port it to Quest 2. And I right. hope we will survive the next month. <laughs> I have to say it as hard like that. Um, but have I you, have you tried, have you tried, it. have you tried to approach people like resolution games or, you know, other people who, who potentially in the industry could help to, to say, look, um, you know, we want to pull this to Quest. This is all the feedback that we've had. It's extremely positive. Uh, we think this would be amazing, but this is how much money we need. So we are in contact with some develop, uh, publishers. Um, mm -hmm. I can't talk about it in detail at the moment, okay. but nothing is safe so far. But yeah, we're working on it. And I thought we could stay independent, but um, yeah, all the marketing stuff and self-publishing is... It's a lot of work. Right. I, you can't 
focus on the game development and that's what we want to deliver the best game we can deliver we're able to do the best and then publishing is a lot of work right so how do you prioritize your time so that you you got the time to do a bit of everything any any uh any tips there oh no tips so i waste so much time no i don't waste time we put too much effort in the game because i think some things important the things are important like texture density mm -hmm. it's, it's homogeneous genius and high resolution textures and high quality and but it, it takes time so all our assets nearly 90 percent of our assets in the game are handmade so in-house right there are no um bought mm -hmm. assets third-party stuff in it and it's a lot of work oh, but people expect that on the pc vr market but, yeah it's a lot of work but time is very very chaotic in our studio we have a creative environment <laughs> mm -hmm. right and uh, have you actually tried to test out a uh, vr skater on the quest already just to get a feel as to what potential challenges you may have in the in the future or not at all at this moment in time um in the past uh, we have uh, we de we've developed an uh, arcade version for a fashion brand and on location, it was for Quest One, and it was with Kenzo and Vance. It's a, a a collection, shoe collection they released, mm -hmm. but it wasn't so successful as our game because um, because of the pandemic and COVID nineteen. So no VR yeah. on location gaming. Oh, <laughs> right, moment. okay, yeah. right. Um, and the challenges we have to face are the performance optimizations. Because we have to rework all assets completely, even for Quest 2. Yeah. But I think we can make it. So you need to put effort into it and to support new headsets. You need uh, the hardware. And right. maybe and they don't sell the dev kits for free. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you have to test, to try. And so we have a very tight schedule. Mm -hmm. and maybe in the future. But um, so our main target is the Oculus Quest 2 uh, at okay. the moment. So um, we think we can, yeah, we can make a pretty cool game for the Quest 2 that looks great and feels great. Um, and then will you have in-app purchases as well? Or will just, it will no, just be no. one price and that's it? Yeah, we think about um, additional map DLCs mm -hmm. in the future, mm -hmm. but that really depends on how well it will sell on PC because, um, yeah, I say. So when, when you see, so when you see apps like, for example, Population One, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's a different game. But when, when you see people like that who have huge amounts of budgets uh, owned by Facebook now, you know, and it's free, but then inside of the app they charge for items. How? What does it make you think when you see stuff like that? Oh, I'm a bit old school. I like to buy a game that is complete and I can have fun with and that's perfect. And mm -hmm. um, I don't feel good with the game as a service philosophy or or microtransactions. And yeah, I don't like it. But population that it costs $19. Now, in the early access, uh, I know you had one map to start off with. Uh, how do you decide on the maps and the art direction for the style of uh, gameplay that you have with VR Skater? What's the process? Well, the process is um, uh, we wanted to release it with one map that's suitable for beginners and you know, um, pro players and a school environment mm -hmm. fits pretty well uh, because it's a... And, when we started to design the game, we wanted to have city environments in the city, mm -hmm. use skating streets, but that's, it turned out that it's too huge. You need a lot of assets and it's right. performance consuming. And the school is an environment you can, yeah, it's one environment and you can um, put the links on both sides mm -hmm. and that works very well. And 
the art style is a mixture between um, performance and what we are able to do in our time frame. Yeah, we're still a small indie company, and yeah, I just want to make it look clean and not crappy with a look over all levels that doesn't change. And so the, the same. Yeah. So the environment is custom made, or did you use asset packs? No, it's all it's all custom made. It has to be custom made because okay. we need to up when we buy an asset pack, mm-hmm. we need to optimize it from the, the ground up. So um, right. you can't just reduce polygons and you need a polygon flow and the textures are always not high res enough from 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 asset packs. It's not for VR. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. You know, most of VR games doesn't have high resolution textures. But we have the problem right. that um, when you play a shooter game in VR, mm-hmm. you're facing forward, and everything what's um, five meters um, in front of you looks great, mm-hmm. even if the texture is not high resolution. Right. In our game, you have you always look uh, around you, at the environment, and on the ground, and it has to look good and crisp and high resolution. So that was a challenge. So your res- yes. your resolution for your textures are. 2K, 4K. I mean, how how high did you go? It's currently it's 1K per meter. Okay. Yeah, it's right. a compromise. Yeah. So it's, did you um, take pic- did you take pictures for the for the textures or did you no, just they, use whatever's online? Um, it's are it's not for photorealistic textures. We wanted to have a slightly stylized look and uh, mm-hmm. these textures are it's hand paint it's not hand painted it's <laughs> texture painting um we mainly use a uh, substance painter mm-hmm. it's yeah and it's mixture of between different textures and yeah our artist paints paints the textures on the, with different materials some mm-hmm. presets yeah right and uh, so talk to me a little bit more about your team and, um, you know, how do you find these guys and, and well, what's it like to, to work with other people on these kind of projects? Okay. Um, we, uh, the core team um, is three people. We are three guys and it's me, a 3D artist and a more programming focused uh, mm-hmm. tech artist for Unreal. Uh, but I think we're all a bit interdisciplinary. And I saw that the game and my 3D artist, Max, um, mm-hmm. is originally, he's a chef. Oh, <laughs> wow, cool. And had a roster. That's really studied, cool. He studied art when he, before he was a chef and had a restaurant. But it, yeah, the restaurant went bankrupt. And so when someone told me, hey, the Max guy, the artist, um, he... he so yo, his life changed. He's not <laughs> a chef anymore, but he's a great artist. And I nice. said, okay, I had nothing to lose at this time. And he had nothing to lose at this time. And I picked him up from the street. <laughs> and <laughs> he, then he had started to learn Blender. He never worked in the in 3D modeling before. Right. And yeah, he's, he's a great 3D artist. And now he's, a, he's very fast and he's, he's doing great stuff in a very short amount of time. Nice. And the other guy is, I met him on, a, on the Unreal Fast Europe. That's a great conference in Epic Games. Mm-hmm. Um, back in Europe, but okay, due to COVID this year or not, last year or not. But, um, of course. Yeah. And he was, he worked with, oh, I don't know. I don't remember the name, the name of the company, but on a PlayStation VR game, he worked mm-hmm. on a PlayStation VR game called Eden Tomorrow. Yeah. Right. Um, but he he had no job at the time also. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, let's work together. <laughs> um, he's, he has also nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. And now I have a really good team, They're highly gifted people. Cool. And so that's also inspired you in many ways to uh, to, to do what you're uh, what you're doing. That energy must have come across in in uh, in, in the team, I imagine. Yeah, but most people um, 
had no interest. Mm -hmm. Ah, I have to go the safe way and I have clients and no, these two guys (laughs) had no clients and no job. Right. Now we're uh, (laughs) developing the, I say the world's first authentic street skateboarding game in VR. Right. We're not from the Bay Area, California. I've never been to California in my life. (laughs) 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 We are developing a skateboarding, designing and developing a skateboarding game that takes place in California, obviously. Mm -hmm. obviously. You know, that's funny. That's we're really countryside here. It's not a city. So are they, are they, are they in the same city as you or they're in different parts of the world? Um, Max, the 3D artists uh, lives in the town. It's not far from here. So it's half an hour and Marcel, the programmer, it's remote working. Yeah. He lives in a different area of Germany, but it it works well. Were you concerned at first when uh, you were looking for people that not only they would have the skill set that you required, but also... Uh, I, I imagine uh, the, the synergy of having these different people within the team so everyone gets along. How do you manage to make sure that everyone keeps motivated and, and, and can resolve the problems together? Um, uh, a bit, bit of creative freedom and um, no crunch time every time. <laughs> and yeah, we have a very relaxed working culture and so they get paid (laughs) but uh, it's not it's not much very low salary but yeah they believe in the project and yeah so you have like a routine like set meetings and uh, a a setup where everybody uh, knows what to do when all that kind of stuff or what do you mean by relaxed uh, atmosphere (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, my, my work is a lot of creative freedom and when Max says, uh, is it okay when tomorrow, when I come to the office at 1 PM, I said, yeah, do what you want. <laughs> do your so job. What's in, so what's yeah. important is basically you guys have like a set deadline of whatever you're doing. Uh, but like many o- other organizations, yeah. as long as long as it's done, that's really what what uh, what you collectively care more about as a group than having to be forced to to work in a certain way. I, I guess also because us creative people are more like that. We we tend not to uh, you know we're not very corporate kind of people, so uh, yeah. we need that that bit more flexibility. Would you say? Yeah, that's it. Right. And, and in, in your daily life, you have challenges to solve and your family. And sometimes it's just hard to, to have the one hour you need to mm-hmm. go to the kindergarten or, right. or, or something. And I don't want to have um, exhausted, stress out people right. in the game. But yeah, but those two guys are crazy enough to work with me. It's everything is chaotic, so we have not a a strict plan. So everything right. is my head, and I say, okay, we now need to do that. <laughs> right. Okay. So you mentioned that you're a musician, composer, um, and that you worked on the music too. So let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, that process as to how it went down. Yeah, um, the coolest thing of a skateboarding game is the soundtrack and the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater soundtrack influenced so many people, even me. And I come from this skate punk, punk rock bubble. I grew up in in this scene. Mm -hmm. And so what the strategy was, we have a skateboarding game and we can make a soundtrack with real artists and bands. Mm-hmm. And they will market the game also, and we help them to become famous. So it's a synergy, a win-win situation. So they are all independent bands that, you know, engaged and with a lot of potential, but not so famous. So that there's room above and they were, every band were so thankful to be part of the project. And I'm thankful that they can be part of the project. 
So, right. but they get paid. So that's a really cool it. idea. I think that's amazing. The problem is we have to pay um, for every copy. We have to pay to the collecting societies. You know, that's right because musicians need to also pay their debts. Mm-hmm. And yeah, um, that means Steam takes thirty percent, and the collecting societies take something, and then there's tax and. Yeah, there's less money, <laughs> but for us. So in this case, I mean, I understand what you're doing is great and it's good, um, but how come you didn't go with uh, perhaps, you know, signing up on EpidemicSound.com and just buy one of those songs there, pay, you know, $50 or $100, and then you're done with it? You know, we want to have an authentic soundtrack with cool bands. And um, I took my time to select those mm-hmm. bands and I've listened to over 500, 500 songs. And I think we have some jewels mm-hmm. on the soundtrack and there's more to come. So cool. Um, and will yeah. you, does this mean you'll be releasing a, a separate, a separate, uh, soundtrack, uh, alongside. So could you put another link on the steam page, for example, to, uh, download the soundtrack and all that kind of stuff. So you only have the soundtrack. I think um, that's a bit complicated. Most gaming soundtracks um, don't have to pay to the collecting societies because um, that's game music. So you can sell the soundtrack. Because oh, okay. The soundtrack from regular games is not on Apple Music or Spotify. So you can't uh, charge a marketing fee, a distributor yeah, fee. That's a bit complicated, and we're right. in. in so you can listen to it on Spotify. We have a Spotify and Apple Music playlist where mm-hmm. you can listen to the soundtrack. And that's great for the artists. Um, what could be an option would be um, vinyl, an LP mm-hmm. with the soundtrack with a big cover. But yeah, that's a lot of licensing stuff. And I have to pay a lawyer who's clean, clearing the rights again for this. And it's not easy. That's why we need a publisher to do all those things. Right. Yeah. But yeah, that was important to us to, to recreate that feeling from mm-hmm. the old school skateboard games with new bands, mm-hmm. with new artists and young people from, yeah, from skate, so, typical. Yeah. So what did the musician, did, they, did the music guys, uh, were they able to try your game? And if so, what was the reaction? Oh, yeah. They are not able to try the game. They don't have VR headsets. Okay. Not yet. So they'll have to wait a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. I hope when um, we are famous and rich, everybody uh, gets his Quest 2 from Deficit Games. Or when it's available <laughs> on on the Quest, wherever, SideQuest, App Lab, or the Quest Store, and they have a... Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the Quest itself is not very expensive. Uh, is yeah. it super... Ex- is it available in Germany, by the way? Are they uh-huh. selling it again? No. <laughs> so we need to, our, our, our developing hardware. We have to buy it in France. Yeah. Right. But Is yeah. Uh, contacting the, the hardware developers something that you guys have thought about? Like contacting, uh, do Facebook have a program where you can get a, yeah, we a are. headset from the... We are in the, in the Oculus Start program. Yes. Okay. But they, you know, they sent us some Quest 1 headsets last year and yeah we are already in contact with HTC but I don't know really how this so that we have hardware so we have contact to hardware SaaS manufacturers but so how so so you mean Facebook have a program for for indie devs what do you need to do in order to join this program um, there is on the Oculus homepage, or you have to Google um, Oculus Start Program. Mm-hmm. I hope they still do this, and you um, apply with a game or a game idea. I can't remember exactly. And you know what's pretty cool? They sent you a welcome package with a VR headset and a uh, hoodie and some stickers. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a- a- access to the Oculus Start Discord, and you can get in contact with Oculus staff. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think Oculus is doing a great job in 
Yeah. So I want to ask you about, well, motion sickness. Yeah, because uh, motion in VR can be something quite difficult to, to, to balance. How do you manage to, to get people to be comfortable in your, how much testing do you have to do? And what kind of things did you have to do to make it comfort, a comfortable experience uh, with VR skater? So, yeah, yeah. It was a long process, uh, but I need to say first that um, nobody has motion sickness so far. Nobody complained about the game because of um, motion sickness. Mm -hmm. But people, some people play the game and said, hey, we can handle it. Give us more freedom. But we decided to design the game this way. And it's not just a button to press, okay, let's do more freedom. And it's all designed in this. There's a lot of reason, performance and comfort. And so street skating is, it is even when there's a X Games contest, street skating parkour is always linear and parallel. And we put this concept and put it into an urban an environment. So it is street skating, so you don't turn around while you skate a line so often in real life skating. I claim that. <laughs> right. So, um, and it has also reasons to make this game comfortable that we want to uh, make the player face forward and turn his body and his head into the direction he skates. Mm -hmm. And you know, we used some techniques to achieve this and it's just a bunch of different things we tried and i think it works well at the now mm -hmm. now it's been it's good yeah but it, it's a it's a, a big topic for us right to, to. and um w when we were talking about maps environments earlier um so basically you can do you have like a do you create like a set template of size of the environment to make sure that everything would work smoothly or how do you go about changing the environments? Um, so uh, what do you mean with changing? Do you mean the process? Well, if you wanna, how yeah, if you want to create a new map, yeah. uh, you know, what, what kind of thought process goes through to know already beforehand that more or less everything will work fine? Okay. The first step is um, that we think about what environment could it be? And is are we able to to um, create this environment um, mm -hmm. with the to uh, sorry <laughs> it's okay no problem to that's performant that, that it stays performant enough on lower end hardware mm -hmm. and then there are blockout levels so Max creates a lot of blockout levels and skating all the time. And every line and every obstacle is placed very carefully that it's in reach. And um, there are so many lines you can do. Most of them we've skated mm -hmm. before you <laughs> skated it. And yeah. And when I say, okay, that level is cool, it's fun, then we start to create the final assets. And when it's finished, 80%, I say, okay, no, that's not good. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> yeah, uh, most levels we do two times. Right. From the ground up. Yeah, this is block out is the longest period. So that we place the obstacles and skate and skate and skate and skate. The problem is right. when we change something mm -hmm. in the controls or in the physics or in the speed or friction. That's not possible because you need to place the obstacle differently. So if you right. So, the, yeah. mm -hmm. so you mean you, you can't just delete everything in your scene, keep everything else as is, and then build around the same scene? You can't do it like that? You have to redo everything? Well, yeah. I don't know if I understand your question. Well, what I mean is, uh, for example, you have your first environment. Mm -hmm. um, it's done. And then you want to move on to the second one. Can you just yeah. delete all the prefabs? Uh, all the, I, I don't know in Unreal if you call them prefabs or not, but can you delete all the objects inside the scene? So all your colliders, all your things are all gone, uh, but you keep the, the raw of everything else 
and then you were to build new walls and new trees and new whatever uh, within that same scene and then just save that file as a separate file. Does it work like that or do you have to uh, rebuild pretty much everything from scratch for a separate scene? Um, when, when we create a new level, we rebuild the whole scene. So right. we, we import lighting as, okay, lighting's same. And so we, we have a lot of placeable objects, mm -hmm. and gameplay, and if we need to align to rails or something. Mm -hmm. And we, to ensure performance, we're not just putting walls in mm -hmm. the scene or, or floors, Max doing nearly everything in Blender. Right. And we need to carefully decide with buildings and objects are one and mm -hmm. which textures we use and what we see in the uh, in the distance. And that's that's the, the was the most pain because we have in our new the, the hardest part the hardest level to make was on the neighborhood level. I don't know if you right. have played it because we have, have not many ways to block the view in the distance. And so I think that's crazy because we have no nearly no lot popping and we have a very far distance view of this level. Right. But yeah, it's all custom and we have to decide with every level how we do it. In terms of art direction and gameplay, now VR is getting a lot more, you know, uh, especially when we're talking about Facebook, who are ex experts when it comes to dopamine. Um, dopamine means retention, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what that, that could also be a little bit dangerous, I guess, because, you know, dopamine levels and it can affect the body and stuff. But what I mean is it can also detract from... Uh, like the realism of the gameplay sometimes, because then you have all these things that are uh, put in a game that, that is very fluffy, meant to make you get excited, but it doesn't really feel real. Um, in terms of the direction of your future uh, maps for VR Skater, are you going to keep to a realistic approach? So for example, I'm just gonna, you know, give some, uh, some imaginary examples, okay? Um, like, you know, uh, skating inside of a sewer or skating inside of a, a parking lot or in a forest, you know, everything looks pretty real, uh, like the real world. Or are you going to want to start incorporating something like, for example, a saint and sinners version uh, where you skate in, 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 in a car park, but then you have all these zombies around and, you know, or, 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 or in the desert you know, or whatever, or are you going to incorporate things like having a power up and then you can flip even higher or it gives you triple points or how yeah. much are you, are you, are you willing to go, um, you know, to, to increase retention in the game? Um, yeah, we thought about all those stuff and we had a lot of ideas and crazy ideas that could be fun, but we need to stay in our time frame and budget and we don't have unlimited possibilities and the main f the focus stays on that this is a semi-realistic street skating experience and I think on the long term this is the right way because the skateboarding games that are successful at the moment and maybe Skate 4 will come and I think that these are the skateboarding games people want to play. Okay, at the moment the Quest platform it's yeah, you're right. They want to see such games that are a bit crazy and rewarding and a bit more arcadey, not so simulation um, type games. But um, skateboarding is getting a renaissance at the moment and it mm -hmm. has been its Olympic discipline for the first time. And I think that a realistic, semi realistic skateboarding is that what we want to do. But if we are skaters succeeds on mobile platforms or on PlayStation, we will um, develop and create new maps and map packs. So a moon <laughs> or a toy land or something. Right. Or and a space the, station. Yeah. Right. Uh, how has feedback from people's comments or going online, watching people's videos, uh, what are some of the comments that you've taken in that you feel has been really helpful uh, to you in the in the development of uh, the game? 
moving forward. Yeah. Okay. That's there are two different groups. I would say um, there are comments and suggestions. I would say okay, it just doesn't make any sense, but people don't know it. And there are some very helpful comments and suggestions and feedback, especially in the pre-release phase. Um, it would have been a disaster if we released the game in that state. Um, like the pre-release version was. <laughs> and it was, uh, feedback was about the difficulty of tutorials and challenges and we changed a lot of things. And we're always in contact with the community on Discord and we're very close with them. But we learned that we have to ignore 50% of the comments because it's always the same questions and, and suggestions and things like add multiplayer, but that's not so easy. No. <laughs> and yeah, we're limited. And yeah, we answered, but I think we answered all the questions so far. But feedback is so important. Yeah. How, how important is it to be open to, to, uh, to, to constructive feedback? Oh, it's the most important thing because Oh, some, some important game designer, famous game designer said it in a book I read. So the most important thing you need to learn is to listen as a game designer. And yeah, that's true. Because sure, we do the game. And we, we want to, to create a game that we love by ourselves. So we love playing We Are Skater. We've developed games and we played it and Asked, and we asked ourselves, hey, who wants to play the shit? We don't want to. <laughs> and we love playing Weird Skater. So we have hundreds of hours in it. And But it's also for the players. And they see things we don't see in our bubble, in our focused, narrowed view. And yeah, so listening is an important part of game design. And how did you manage to to grow your community? At which point did you start having a Discord channel? Uh, when you mean community, is it Discord or is it? Uh, do you mean it's a whole bunch of different platforms? Um, and 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 when did you start to build this community? Before you had a release or afterwards? Um, short, short before, shortly before the the early access release. Um, yeah, you know, it's a lot of work to manage the community, but there instantly there were some guys who said, hey, I can be the moderator and your game is great. And let me restructure your Discord. And yeah, we are mainly it's on Discord because it's great to chat and hang out. And they're posting their scores there and some videos and their new skateboard videos. Not many, but yeah, it's really heartwarming. And you know, we're really proud of our community. So how, how did you go about starting this community on Discord? Um, um, I'm in contact with some um, YouTubers and I can't remember, but I invited them and some some you know, influencers like Beato Banjo went to join the Discord and they invited some other people and we posted the link you know, on the Steam page and it's uh, in the community hub and mm -hmm. people join more and more but it started all it started with youtubers that joined the discord and some of our best players so it's crazy it's not possible to to get these scores but uh, i think now i know it's possible <laughs> well what are some of the what are the three tips or three things you would say to anyone who wants to create a VR game as an indie developer, what are the three key things that they should really look at first and foremost uh, in terms of the advice you could give them? Uh, don't wait. <laughs> um, do it full time, but calculate well. So you need double the money you expected you need. And the most important advice I can give, ask yourself, who wants to play this shit? If the answer is raw or ooh, it, it's cool, it's funny to throw things, it's not the game you should make. It should be a game 
that you want to play and you would buy for $30 or the price you want to charge. I think that's, and if you love your game by yourself, you will be able to finish it. Okay, money is a problem, I know, but well, I cannot give good advice because, um, yeah. No, I think that's we're, great advice. We are, yeah, we are to, struggling at the moment to sell. No, but topics. it doesn't matter because you, that's where people start, right? Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I personally, I think it's amazing what you guys have accomplished. You, uh, you managed to get a game that's been talked about all the biggest news outlets out there and, uh, yeah, publishing exactly. magazines, uh, biggest YouTubers have tried your game published on their channel. Uh, you've had God knows how many downloads and people giving you all their feedback based on on the work you've done. So good pat on the back, uh, honestly speaking. And I think we all look forward to uh, what's coming next and we can't wait. So very, very um, positive outlook uh, in, in your future for sure. So no Thank worries you. there. Yeah. All right. Final say, take it away. The mic is yours. Go skateboarding in real life. Grab a deck and do some kickflips, ollies, or whatever you want to do. And when it's dark or night or a rainy day, then VR skate. <laughs> but skateboarding is always a good idea, digital or analog. <laughs> I got something to show you before we leave. I think it's here, yeah. <laughs> That's my board. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Very old board. This is like, oh my God, 30 years. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Cool shape. Yeah. Nice. That's from my mom on her wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Still anyway, uh, buddy, thank you so much for uh, for being on the call today. 